Hey, good morning. My name is Cormac Prick. I'm excited to be here to talk about how generative AI on the edge is becoming increasingly popular. Thanks to lots of really good work by the PyTorch in the wider open model ecosystem, and also highlight how some of the projects um, I'm working on are kind of also helping that effort. Okay, so when we work with edge developers um, and edge development teams, they just want to build great apps. And they've seen the potential of generative AI, and they want to translate that into great AI-enabled experiences that work well for all of their users. They'd love to be able to build new AI-powered applications that respond instantly, that work offline, and that allow them to build personalized experiences while still respecting privacy by keeping data local and seamlessly scale to a wide user base in a cost-effective way. Using compute on edge devices helps in all of these ways, on availability, on price, and on cost. And when we say edge, this can mean deploying across mobile, desktop, IoT devices, or even locally within the browser. Now, if you were to go back to the beginning of the Gen AI revolution three or four years ago, the idea of deploying to edge devices would have seemed wild, right? These days, that's no longer the case. And what I want to show in this talk is across each of these Gen AI needs that how the community is responding to meet these needs and also how a couple of projects from our team are helping out. So first off in compute, um, we've seen a lot this year, a lot of coverage on how AI requires tons and tons of compute. And we've also seen how um, you know, NVIDIA products, particularly H100s, have been really, really popular. So an interesting way to kind of baseline what's going on on the edge is let's have a look at the total amount of compute that's projected to ship this year with H100s. So we can see from this chart, that's a very large number. It's like four Zeta ops, which is like a billion tops. Um, and that's a projected number that will ship with NVIDIA H100s this year. Meanwhile, if you look, there's a much quieter revolution has been happening in the world of mobile NPUs. And there, it's estimated that roughly you know, kind of five Zeta ops will ship in mobile NPU acceleration in 2024. So this is kind of showing that there is a heap of potential that's now being unleashed in the mobile ecosystem. And not just to call out NPUs, we, we also work directly with a lot of GPU optimizations and CPU. And later we'll see some examples of how, you know, GPU compute for this is working really well, as well on the edge. Next up, let's have a look at what's happening in the world of model quality, right? Um, so here we're looking at large and small open models and what's been happening over the last, you know, 12 months. Um, so we see here there's been great, if we look at the blue bars, we see a clear kind of up and to the right trend where there's been, you know, great innovations in large open models that are delivering lots of exciting capabilities to the open ecosystem. Then let's look at what we call smaller models. And here, for, for the purpose of this chart, we're limiting the models with less than 4 billion parameters. That's an important kind of breakpoint because even with, you know, if we get 4-bit quantization, that allows us to kind of fit both model and runtime often into kind of less than 2 gigabytes of DDR memory footprint. And that's a, that's a really useful number if we want to scale to lots of mobile devices. So then looking at the green bar chart, we can see we're going, you know, from where we were um, at the start of this year uh, with Gemma 2, and then it was a kind of Phi 3 model, and then just recently at the end of last month, we had a Gemma 2 model getting released. And what's interesting is you compare to the state of the art of really large open models where we were last year to you know, what's now capable, even in the last month, with what the open model ecosystem is doing for smaller footprint models. Um, yeah, this is amazing. There's really uh, uh, amazing, um, capabilities are being delivered into users' hands um, that are relevant and ready for on-device experimentation. Okay, next up I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of deploying classic LML uh, versus deploying Gen AI. Uh, so in the world of classic ML, life is kind of relatively straightforward. You would define and train a model, you'd use Torch export, you'd export to a particular Edge AI toolkit, such as like AI Edge Torch, Onyx, Exec Torch, or Tensor RT. And then you would deploy, and your application would have a pretty simple construct of kind of application logic. You'd wrap a model, and you'd call a runtime API. Now, with deploying Gen AI from PyTorch, this picture gets a little bit more complicated. Um, and that's kind of resulted in some kind of more boutique frameworks um, for on-device um, generative AI deployment. Um, 
that have also become you know, popular for edge deployment. So there's a few key ideas of what we'd like to be able to do uh, to make this better starting from PyTorch. One is we really want to keep developing in PyTorch. You know, there's no need for you to leave and use a completely different set of tools just because you want to deploy Gen AI to the edge. And typically all of your model evals um, that you want to use are gonna start in Py PyTorch, as long as kind of, along with fine tuning capabilities like Torch Tune. Also, it's really helpful for edge deployment to have a single model artifact that has all of the model weights but is flexible enough to enable deployment in different ways. So this means exporting a separate entry point for kind of prefill and decode, while also being able to share weights. If you had like a multimodal model with a specific image encoder or audio encoder, that would also happen here. And one of the key points here is we also want to have a lot of flexibility in how we deploy. And this is one of the things that makes, you know, the generative AI picture different is how we want to deploy. So. For different types of applications, we may want to kind of, um, we may want to have kind of a lot of application specific customizations of how the KV cache is used. Let's say for really common prompts, you want to kind of store a KV cache state that corresponds to like really common um, prompt prefixes. Or you want to call, you know, decode either in kind of smaller or larger increments depending on the type of user interface you want to see. So by having this type of scheme where we can export a model with different entry points, this then allows application developers to build lots of different types of applications starting from the same model artifact without having the need to go back to the framework if they just want to you know, have a different KV cache scheme or different um, way of integrating their model with um, the rest of their application. Okay. So if there are the requirements, um, one way um, that our team has been working on to meet those requirements has been deploying Gen AI to the edge using AI Edge Torch, which is a library within PyTorch, and Light or T, which is an optimized runtime for mobile deployment. And here the flow is you build the models in PyTorch using you know, the tools we've heard about earlier, like kind of, you know, you could use things like Torch Tune, and then you use AI Edge Torch optimized layers. You can then optimize and validate all within PyTorch, apply custom quantization, and then you can convert and run in kind of the LightRT runtime. A quick aside here is LightRT is a rename for TensorFlow Lite uh, that we did earlier this month, and that reflects, um, reflects an evolution that's happened in that product over the last um, six months to support, um, to have great support for PyTorch in addition to um, other ecosystem frameworks. Um, one benefit of this is it allows you to deploy generative AP um, the generative AI models to edge devices using the same kind of runtime and techniques that you use for all of your classic ML models as well. And this AI, AI, AI Edge Torch project uh, includes lots of different examples of the types of smaller models that I was talking about earlier, including Time Alama, Gemma, OpenELM, Phi2, Smallum, T5, Stable Diffusion, and we're continuing to add more as they become relevant to edge developers. Now let's uh, take a look at what that looks like in code. So we're not gonna read through all of this. Uh, two key ideas here is, this is tiny lama constructed in less than 30 lines of code. Uh, in the top we see some just kind of classic NN modules which are you know, really um, kind of standard PyTorch. Uh, and lower down we have a particular implementation of um, uh, an optimized rope catch as is used in tiny lama. Secondly, this is how we export that idea of being able to have a, uh, being able to export a model with multiple signatures is a key idea, particularly we've, um, yeah, two different signatures and shared weights between them. And this is showing how after Torch export, we export a model um, using AI Edge to create a single file that can be deployed to Edge devices and still allowing developers all of that customization. Okay, so when we put it all together, um, we can end up with applications that looks like this one. This is an example of a Gemma variant running on mobile GPU, and we can see that the output here is pretty quick. Um, we ourselves have benchmarked the performance of, um, you know, kind of AI edge torch running on edge devices compared to earlier work that some of our teams did internally, uh, which was kind of fully handwritten, and we find it compares really favorably within 10% of the target performance. Um, this application is also available fully open source if anybody wants to 
Um, anybody who wants to hack with that code today, that code is available. And um, this model is also running fully on GPU. Uh, we're also working really closely with kind of uh, different hardware vendors, as we've seen that NPUs are going to be really important to the future of generative, um, the future of generative um, AI. Okay, uh, so that's it for the kind of model development and deployment, but you know, what when things go wrong or you're worried about performance? So next up, I'd like to look at a tool that we've developed on how we can visualize models and understand performance, both of which are really critical um, for on-device use. So that tool is called Model Explorer. Um, here we're looking at a uh, version of Gemma 2 viewed in the tool. Uh, the tool has a few key ideas. Um, one is it's capable of handling you know, massively large models, something which existing ecosystem tools can't do. So Gemma 2 has 2,000 nodes. We've te tested this in very large internal models of up to 50,000 nodes, and it performs seamlessly. The second, with these really large models, it's very helpful to have um, uh, to have model hierarchy reflected in how you uh, view the models. So here you can start off with a, with a uh, kind of very zoomed out kind of top level view, which will show only kind of major blocks of the network, or you can also drill down through layers of hierarchy to see, um, for example, in this screen grab of how the you know, particular attention layer is behaving within the Gemma model. And additionally, while you view that, you can see lots of metadata about the model on the right. And as an open source project, one of the really nice things about this is it's highly extensible. So it's very easy to add support for new model formats, but also it has this kind of neat idea of kind of custom model metadata overlays where you can produce, um, where you can give the model additional files, additional JSON files that have the um, node names and additional information, and then um, view that in various ways as something like a heat map. So this is back to the, uh, tiny llama uh, model, and here we're looking at a kind of heat map of kind of runtime latency running on um, a CPU for, for that model. And you can see the, the final fully connected layer is what's uh, resulting in low runtimes for, um, for this variant. Um, yeah, so this project is available today, and it supports multiple frameworks. It supports um, PyTorch exported programs, which is the example you can see at the end. You can just call PyTorch export, and then um, just pass that exported uh, program to a Model Explorer visualizer. And we support multiple frameworks, so both kind of PyTorch, LightWorks T exported, the community has provided Onyx implementation in the last couple of months, and we also support TensorFlow and JAX. Cool, um, that's kind of mostly it for me today. Uh, takeaways, um, one, it's a really exciting time ahead for Gen AI on edge devices. Uh, there is a growing amount of compute available with better and better abstractions on top of it. And also there's a really rapid pace of model innovation at the edge. Second is the PyTorch ecosystem is doing lots to help uh, get generative AI models running well on the edge. So here there's kind of two projects that I've discussed which are from our team around AI Edge Torch and Model Explorer. Uh, also, a quick shout out to a couple of other projects you heard about earlier today, like Torch Chat and Torch Tune, also really exciting um, uh, projects in the space. Um, also, I would say you can come check out the Model Explorer has a poster session. Uh, if you want to kind of talk to the Model Explorer team this evening, they'll be available at that. And also, there's a booth we have with um, examples of uh, real devices running these types of models if you want to kind of come check that out as well. Um, yeah, so that's it uh, for me today. Uh, really excited to be here as part of the PyTorch ecosystem and really excited to see what you're going to build with uh, each of these tools. Thank you.